Hey, what's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a future upload. This video is going to be a little less formal than what I normally post, but I just wanted to come on here and not only tell Kevin's story, but also have a conversation with you guys. This case really weighed on my heart and hits close to home. Some of you may have already heard of Kevin's story. Jeffree Star spoke about it, and actor Kevin Bacon sent his condolences to the family for obvious reasons. We are going to be discussing what happened to Kevin Bacon, the startling statistics surrounding online dating, and how we can hopefully prevent this from happening again. So Kevin Bacon was a 25-year-old man living in Swartz Creek, Michigan. He was a hairdresser and student and recently lost his life after meeting a man on Grindr. For those that are unaware, Grindr is a social networking app that is geared towards gay, bi, trans, and queer people. And from what I understand, it's similar to Tinder. You swipe through and match with people you're interested in and start a conversation from there. In December of 2019, Kevin matched with a 50-year-old man named Mark Latunsky who lived in the nearby town of Morris, Michigan. The two men spoke briefly and planned to meet on Christmas Eve, but sadly, things went downhill sometime throughout that evening. But before we get to that, let's go back to the beginning. Kevin was born on November 29, 1994, to his parents Carl and Pamela Bacon. Carl's name starts with a K, and because they wanted their baby to have the same initials, they landed on the name Kevin Bacon. They said that at that time, the actor Kevin Bacon wasn't as well known, and they felt that Kevin really suited him. The Bacons provided a loving home for Kevin and his sister Jennifer, and they were incredibly accepting when Kevin came out as a gay man later in life. They were supportive and always encouraged him to be himself, which is amazing because, as we know, that isn't always the case. Kevin graduated from Swartz Creek High School and decided to pursue his passion for hair and makeup. It was then that he attended Sharps Hair Academy in Grand Blanc, Michigan. He completed the program and soon began working as a hairstylist at various salons in Swartz Creek. He specialized in vivid colors like pinks, purples, and blues. Kevin was anything but average. He was so full of life and people fell in love with him everywhere he went, which is why he made such a great hairstylist. Despite having such amazing talent, Kevin still had big dreams and wanted to better his life further. He began studying psychology at the University of Michigan at the Flint campus. Kevin enjoyed spending time with his family and friends and adored his two cats, Smokey and Fuzzy, as well as his dog, Hannah. Kevin had multiple tattoos and he made it known that he had them because they made him feel comfortable and beautiful in his own skin. He was a huge Taylor Swift and Jeffree Star fan to the point that he had multiple Jeffree Star tattoos. He was an all-around great guy and had so much to offer the world. I want to talk about the details surrounding Kevin's disappearance. As I said earlier, Kevin previously matched with a man on Grindr named Mark Lichtunsky, and the two had plans to meet on Christmas Eve. The holidays are a busy time of year for stylists, and Kevin was at the salon until 4 p.m. that evening. As far as we know, his day was busy, but normal. He headed home once he finished up from work. I'm assuming to shower, change his clothes, like any of us would to get ready for a date. Kevin left his house at approximately 5 p.m., at which time he told his roommate and best friend that he was going to be linking up with a man he met on Grindr. I'm not sure if that's something that Kevin did often, but Michelle didn't think anything of it. It's unclear where Kevin was supposed to meet Mark, but it's a common belief that he actually drove straight to Mark's house. The two seemed to hit it off, and the date was going well at first. Kevin texted Michelle at 6.12 p.m. and told her that Mark was inviting other men over. He said that he was having fun, and that he was going to be out late, but he would be home later that night. Michelle responded about 15 minutes later, but her text never delivered, which in hindsight she believes is suspicious, because Kevin never turned his phone off. Sadly, those texts would be the last time anyone heard from Kevin. The following morning, so on Christmas morning, Kevin was supposed to go meet up with his family and have breakfast with them at 9 a.m. When he didn't show up at that time, his family just believed that maybe he was running a little bit late or that something had come up. But as the day went on, they grew increasingly concerned when Kevin hadn't shown up by 5 p.m. And all of their calls and texts were going unanswered. The Bacon family contacted Michelle only to find out that he never came home from his date. Obviously, they were extremely concerned, so they contacted police at that time. 
Kevin's family began driving around Swartz Creek, hoping to find any clues as to where their son could be. It's unclear who specifically discovered Kevin's car. There are many conflicting articles that police discovered it, or it's possible that the Bacons discovered it. It was found in the parking lot of a large plaza near the family dollar store. So I think what happened is the Bacons were driving around, found the car, and then contacted the police. Inside the car, police found Kevin's phone and wallet, which was obviously very alarming. The police then took the car into evidence and later discovered that the clothes Kevin was wearing when he left were folded and placed in a bag in the back seat. There were only two things that were missing, the keys to the car and Kevin. By the 27th of December, there were search parties and police searching for Kevin, but they found no sign of him anywhere. Michelle was able to get into Kevin's laptop and signed into his Grindr account. However, she didn't find any clues because all of his messages had been erased. At that point, his family attempted to contact Grindr to see if they could recover the messages that were deleted. However, Grindr was unwilling to cooperate or give any information without a warrant. And as we all know, warrants take time. Time that the Bacon family didn't have. Which I find incredibly sad and kind of disgusting on Grinder's part because all the Bacons were asking for is the messages to be restored so they could figure out where he went and try to retrace his steps. Later in the evening on the 27th, Michelle received word that Mark Latunsky could be involved in Kevin's disappearance. She told the police this, and they actually took it very seriously. When they looked into Mark Latunsky further, they discovered that he had been involved in another incident a month prior, which the police were called over yet again. Basically, to sum up what happened, there was a 29-year-old man that met up with Latunsky. They met online, and they hooked up. Everything was consensual in the beginning, but at some point throughout their time together, Latunsky really made this man feel uncomfortable, to the point that he literally had to escape from his house. At that point, he ran to Latunsky's neighbor's house and banged on the door. Thankfully, the man was home at the time, and when he opened the door, he saw a man standing there with only a leather kilt on. The man was bleeding from his mouth, screaming, help me! So, the neighbor obviously called the police, and as he was doing so, Latunsky pulled into the driveway. He basically said that it was a misunderstanding and began to explain away, but the neighbor told him he needed to leave, and the police arrived immediately afterwards. The unnamed man, scratch that, the victim, literally told police that he was afraid that Latunsky was going to kill him. He told them that it was consensual in the beginning, but at some point it turned into something that wasn't consensual. Latunsky claimed that he was only chasing after the victim because he was wearing a leather kilt that belonged to Latunsky. Apparently it was worth like $300, and the police just thought it was a misunderstanding. The victim repeatedly told police that he didn't want to press charges and he just wanted to go home and he did leave with the police at that time. Strangely enough, that was only one of two victims the neighbor saw running from Latunsky's home since October. Mark Latunsky was also arrested for custodial kidnapping in September of 2013. However, the courts determined that he was not fit to stand trial. So when police read this backstory on Mark Latunsky, they were obviously really concerned about Kevin's safety. They decided to conduct a wellness check and arrived at Latunsky's home at approximately 1 a.m. on December December 28th. It was then that he admitted to killing Kevin, and he told police that he stabbed him with a knife in the back, and then slit his throat. Allegedly, Latunsky then told police that he hung Kevin from the ceiling rafters by tying a rope around his ankles. He then told police that he cut off parts of Kevin's body and ate them. There are more details that I'm not comfortable getting into, out of respect for Kevin's family. If you want the gruesome details, feel free to google it. Obviously, Latunsky was then arrested and charged with open murder and mutilation. Now, I want to briefly discuss Mark Latunsky and who he really is. I really hate when people focus more on the perp than the victim, but in this case, I feel that it's relevant to tell the story. So if you're not interested in hearing about Latunsky, feel free to skip forward in the video. As I stated before, Mark Latunsky is a 50-year-old man who was living in Morris, Michigan. He had four children with his ex-wife, but eventually came out of the closet and married a man named Jamie in 2015. Oddly enough, Latunsky met his husband on Grindr, and the two shared an interest in Fifty Shades of Grey activity, if you catch my drift. He was a chemist and was well educated. It seems like at one point he actually had his life together. However, Latunsky was spiraling through 2019. He has a history of mental illness, which I think have contributed to the things that have happened and that he's done. 
In February, he lost his job. His husband claims that he left him and moved out of their home in September. In October, there was an unnamed male running from his house. In November, he had a similar incident with another male. And then he allegedly took Kevin's life in December. So, it's clear that his life was falling apart. Jamie claims that he and Latunsky are no longer together because he started exhibiting very strange behavior. He was growing increasingly paranoid. He believed that their neighbor was polluting their water well and that his biological family was not really his family. He said that his children weren't really his. Really just bizarre behavior. In addition to this, he actually used an app that tracked the sexual encounters that he and Jamie had. And when he thought that they weren't having sex enough, he made public Facebook posts about how his husband was no longer appealing to him. And he claimed that Jamie didn't want to sleep with him because of the protein powder that he was using. Latunsky posted ads on the website rentmen.com, which is exactly what it seems. Jamie just couldn't deal with it anymore. He said that Latunsky was toxic and that he literally feared for his life. But strangely enough, the two were together on Christmas, just hours after Latunsky allegedly took Kevin's life. And the two were together again on the 27th, while people were out searching for Kevin. I feel that it's important to note that Jamie does claim that he has an airtight alibi for Christmas Eve and that he was not involved. I don't know if there are any other men involved like Kevin suggested to Michelle. However, Kevin was a large man. His estimated weight was 300 pounds. So I find it strange that Latunsky was able to overpower Kevin and then hang him from the rafters by himself. Okay, obviously all of this is alleged and I don't want to speculate too much or accuse the wrong people. Obviously we all know that Latunsky is innocent until proven guilty, even though he admitted to it and was the only person there at the time. It was recently released that the judge will allow an insanity plea, but I sincerely hope that Mark Latunsky receives a punishment that he deserves. I think it's clear that Latunsky was suffering from mental health issues, and I'm in no way trying to shame people that deal with those issues. However, there are plenty of people that deal with mental health issues that don't go out and murder people. And he obviously should be locked away for life because he's very dangerous. I'm not going to speculate too much on how this case is going to move forward. Maybe at some point I'll do an update video once the trial's done. However, I really wanted to come on here and talk about Kevin. And I wanted to remember him on my channel because he was a wonderful, smart person and the world is going to miss him. <clears throat> my audience is primarily made up of women. Most of you are at an age where you'd be comfortable using online dating or just meeting people online in general. But I do have men on here as well. I think Kevin's story proves that this can happen to anyone. We obviously know that women are at a higher risk when it comes to dating in general. And because of that, I think it's women that are more aware of those dangers because they have to be. Men tend to let their guard down much more. And I just wanna remind everyone to stay adamant about your safety. Stay alert and be skeptical of everything. Something similar to this happened to a friend of mine as well. I'm not going to get into all the details right now, but basically he met a woman on Tinder and took her on a date. Later in the evening, the two went back to his home. She basically scoped out everything and decided he had things that she wanted. Then the next day, she brought three guys to his house to rob him. He was actually home at the time, and they ended up murdering him as a result. Dating in general can be dangerous, but online dating seems to be a playground for scammers and other people that have ill intentions. Every year, internet predators commit over 16,000 abductions, 100 murders, and thousands of sexual assaults. 1 in 10 sex offenders utilize online dating services to meet people. I don't know how many cases I've looked into where the internet was involved in someone's death. There are scammers, psychos, and predators. So I just want to remind you guys that whether you're dating online or offline, please stay safe. Okay, here are some safety tips just in case you need a reminder. Don't give out too much information. Don't tell people where you work. Don't give out your phone number right away. Don't post photos of your new car or the outside of your house. Google the people that you're meeting before you meet them. Consider using FaceTime. Obviously meet in public for the first few dates. And make sure that you pick the place. Tell multiple people where you're going and when you'll be back. Have a safety word so when you text them, they know it's really you. Stay alert, watch your drink, and don't drink too much. Just be cautious. 
I know doing these things can seem overdramatic, especially if you're just trying to have a casual fling, but it can literally save your life. I will definitely be following Kevin's case closely, and I can update you guys if more information becomes available. Jeffree Star actually ended up donating over $20,000 to the Bacon family, and I'll post the link if you want to donate to them as well. But that's all I got for you today, guys. Please make sure to be respectful in the comments, because Kevin's family could see what you're saying. And if you don't, YouTube will most likely filter it out, or I'll just delete it. So you probably shouldn't even waste your time with negativity. For everyone else, thank you so much for watching, and as always, remember the name Casey Shane. I'm out. If you don't know, two of my amazing supporters, subscribers, and fans passed away over the last few weeks. Um, Kevin Bacon in Flint, Michigan, and Dylan Cook in San Diego, California. Both of them died tragically over the last few weeks, and I just wanted to give love and support to their families, and just know that um, you will always be a part of my soul and my heart, and I love you guys. Rest in peace to both of them, and that's how I want to end this video. You never know how long you're gonna have with someone, anyone, family, friends, so let's spend a little bit more time this year maybe being a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more loving, because the internet has been so, so ugly to a lot of us, and um, there just seems to be more love, so.